Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the webinar on North South Arts, Business and Climate Governance. Uh, my name is Janice Sarah, and I am a professor of law at the University of British Columbia and one of the co-investigators of the Canada Climate Law Initiative, uh, which is a collaboration of the University of British Columbia and York University. And our goal is really uh, to conduct research and knowledge mobilization on a legal basis for companies, pension funds, and others to actually decarbonize and manage climate-related financial risks. Um, so we advance knowledge. And I want to commence today by acknowledging that UBC is located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. So today is a little different from most of our public webinars on climate governance as we decided to mix the visual and performing arts. We matched Canadians with business people, artists and creatives in the global south to find out what we can learn from an exchange on climate change. So we have insights from business, literature, visual arts and song and we're gonna have some fun along the way. My thanks to the Wall Institute for Advanced Studies for supporting this round table and all the other groups that were listed on the front slide. Um, and so first up are three very distinguished speakers. Uh, first will be Dr. Stephanie Bertels. She's director of the Center for Corporate Governance and Sustainability at Beatty School of Business, Simon Fraser University. She'll be followed by Lisette Stein, who's head of reporting uh, groups strategic risk at Nedbank in South Africa. And then finally, in this first part segment uh, is Carl Bates, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Surter Group uh, in South Africa, and they'll speak in that order. So please, Stephanie, take it away. Thanks very much. Um, so I think Janice has asked me to just speak a little bit about um, climate governance. I think the first is that we're seeing a growing consensus um, that climate change is what we call a systemic risk. And that means it affects global financial markets. And that means it affects all companies, irrespective of their industry. Already, we're seeing that the impacts of climate change are making our economy and our communities more vulnerable to economic shocks. Unfortunately, the pandemic that we're experiencing is just illustrating this even more pointedly. Um, climate models point to an increase in extreme weather events and the potential for mass climate migration. And I think that's particularly salient for the global south as equatorial countries become inhabitable over the next half century. Models predict that we will go from 1% of our planet um, to 20% of our planet, mostly centered around the equator that, that becomes inhabitable. Um, so in many ways, though, I think South African boards are ahead of North American companies when it comes to integrating sustainability and climate risk into governance. As early as 1994, the South African Institute of Directors launched um, the King Codes for corporate governance. And when the Earth Summit came to Johannesburg in 2002, they um, addressed sustainability within those codes. And then King 3 brought in integrated reporting, but I think one of the big um, pieces of the puzzle was the Johannesburg Stock Exchange making the King Codes a listing requirement. And this really pushed South African companies to consider these issues way before most other global jurisdictions. So when I speak with South African directors, I'm really struck by how many of them talk about their commitment to the future of the country. Many of them were engaged in talks about the National Development Plan, and as a result, they have a really clear sense that business relies on a healthy environment and a resilient society, and that companies have an obligation to contribute to society's success. And we'll hear from Lizette about Nedbank in a moment. Nedbank CEO Mike Brown has been very clear that there is no successful bank in an unsuccessful society. So I think there's a quite a bit that northern companies can learn about climate government um, from South African companies. I think the last thing I'll say is that I think Northern companies will also really need to confront some hard realities about climate justice. Um, the value of many companies has been built on the back of historical emissions. So this, for the South, if they're going to develop their economies, Northern companies are really going to need to radically reduce their emissions in the near term and shift into a net negative mode in order to actually start to address their historical emissions. And we are already seeing leading companies like Microsoft start to acknowledge this and make these commitments. 
So the last thing I'll say as we as we turn over to Lizette is that banks in particular, I think, play a very powerful role in shaping the future through what they choose to finance. And I think it's really laudable to see companies like NedBank taking the initiative to address their role in financing a climate transition. So I'll turn it over to Lizette. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> I'm um, from one of the big banks in South Africa, so NetBank, as uh, Stephanie told you. So we are a purpose-led bank, and um, we believe strongly that we apply our expertise to do good for individuals as well as societies. So we've on, uh, embarked on this climate journey um, a while ago. Um, so um, what we've done is we were actually one of the first banks that passed resolutions against ourselves. So Charles, if you can just quickly go to the second slide, please. I just want to touch on the resolutions quickly, and then we'll come back to the slide. So what we've done is we became the first South African company to pass resolutions against ourselves. Our shareholders adopt, adopted to this, and they voted in agreement with 100% votes. So if you look at essentially what we're trying to achieve is our, our first paragraph is we are looking to adapt uh, energy policy by April 2021. We've already released a thermal coal policy in April 2020, so of this year. So since April, uh, since um, 2017, we as NetBank committed to not fund any new thermal coal mines, as well as this year, we were one of the first South African banks to introduce parameters around um, monitoring how we our funding and lending relates to um, thermal coal activities. Then if you look at our second resolution, we embarked on a journey of, to disclose our journey related to climate related risks and opportunities. And this will go around our approach to measure, disclose and assess. Charles, if you can just go back to the first slide, please. So if you look at that, we um, decided to align um, what our, our disclosures to global best practices, which is task force and climate related disclosure. So if you look at the four pillars, governance, strategy, risk management, metrics and targets, I've spoken a bit around our strategy, but I just wanna focus a bit on governance. So I'm not gonna be as excited, I, as exciting. I didn't write a song about governance, but, we are doing a lot of work. So we've established a climate task team in the back end of last year, and they are responsible for operationalizing um, the climate related risks across the enterprise. Then we have a climate risk committee that's chaired by the CRO. Um, this meets on a monthly basis. And then from Feb 2021, we will have our first board committee, which we call the group um, climate resilience committee. Then I just want to highlight a few salient points on our strategy. So we've been the first bank um, to um, adhere to the equator principles since 2005. We've embarked on a journey for fair share 2030, uh, where we actually acknowledged how important water resilience is and so on. I, I encourage you guys to read more up on fair share. As I mentioned in 2017, we um, advised that we're gonna stop funding any new thermal coal stations. Then um, in 2018, we embarked on the journey to take the learnings from Fair Share 2030 to align to the SDGs, so the Sustainable Development Goals. In 2019, we became the first um, bank to rest, list renewable energy bonds on the JSE. And then, as I mentioned, in 2020, we tabled the two climate-related resolutions. We are currently in the process of drafting a climate risk management framework informed by the global best practices. It's going through our internal governance processes, and um, we are looking at the risk as well as the opportunities, because with any bank, we tend to look at risks, but however, there is a lot of opportunities which we need to um, inform ourselves by. Then from a metrics and targets perspective, um, this gets a bit tricky. Um, we, um, so we have been carbon neutral for the last decade. So from an operational point of view, we've been man, man, monitoring that and tracking that. However, we've been barked on our lending book, which is uh, the thermal coal policy as I discussed earlier, and then we will evolve this journey. 
So um, I'm going to hand over to Carl, which will let us know about the SMEs and uh, governance around the smaller companies in South Africa. Thanks so much and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Carl Bates and I'm the Chief Executive of the Sadar Group and we work predominantly with private companies and family businesses uh, across the African continent. And I've been asked to speak today in the context of effective climate governance, uh, specifically in private companies and family businesses. And I think the first thing I wanted to say in the context of North um, South perspectives is that climate change in the context of Africa, um, it is easy for us to apply uh, standards that we expect to see in my home country in New Zealand and places like Australia or in Canada and the United States to countries that are still on a development cycle. And while I don't think that that gives uh, the African economy uh, a carte blanche on, a cl on ignoring climate development, um, it does need to be taken into context when we're balancing um, climate change initiatives with economic activity and growth um, in those countries. And I think where that then starts, particularly in the context of private and family businesses, is in the need and the understanding of having a board in the first place. I think in a lot of, um, a, a lot of context or, or the, the understanding of this conversation is that there is a need for climate governance. That presupposes that businesses already have some form of effective governance in place, that the climate change um, a focus can be added to their board calendar um, or to their agenda. And the reality is, unfortunately, that that's not the case. So I think work that goes into enabling businesses to understand the value of governance in its entirety, inclusive of the role of directors in needing to ensure a climate focus uh, in the role that they play in effective stewardship um, and direction of government of governance or of companies as uh, entities responsible for both economic and social change um, is, uh, is an important part um, of the work that we do around climate governance. Thirdly, COVID-19 uh, is, is the hashtag and the topic in every conversation right now. And, and I'm doing one of the things that I hate, which is bringing it up in a conversation. But that said, it has given the opportunity for a more conscious driver or focus being brought to the table around decision making when it comes to the role um, of governance and the role directors and boards have in ensuring a variety of topics um, are on the agenda. And I think it's also given us a focus on the role businesses play in protecting and supporting a society in a wider sense, but also in the context um, of our, our planet, um, our environment, and of course, in, in the specific context, the climate as part of that. And I think what it's done is it's forced boards to reflect themselves on how seriously they were taking the risks that didn't necessarily translate directly into a bottom line result. I think more practically speaking, the, the fourth item I wanted to raise as part of this conversation is what I call determining your position. Throughout this last six months, we've done a lot of work with boards around getting them to determine what their position was in relation to their COVID-19 response. And what we meant by that is that the best way to understand moving forward is to determine where you're currently standing and then work out where it is that you want to go. And I think that there are a lot of businesses that, that may think they're addressing issues such as climate change, but haven't actually sat back and said, this is our position. This is where we stand on this issue. So that policy can be determined within the business, practically speaking, about everything from supply chain management through to pricing, and the impact that those things have on the commercials of the business. And so for those of you wearing a director hat in private and family businesses that may not have the sort of reporting requirements that Lizette's just referred to for some of the larger organizations like Medbank in South Africa, 
determine as a board, as a business, even if you're the sole director of your own company, what is your position on climate change? What is it that you want uh, to be known for as an organization? Um, and how do you want that to translate into the way in which you run your organization? Lastly, uh, in the context of today's conversation, North, South, and the perspectives uh, that we have on arts, governance, and of course, uh, and of course climate change in a cross-border context. I think it's very easy for us to stand in our home turf, in our own turf, and project the successes of our own nation or our own business on what should be happening in another country. And I think often this happens in relation to uh, the African continent. Uh, funnily enough, my wife and I, over the last couple of days, have been speaking about international travel, not that we intend on getting on a plane anytime soon, but just when we would start traveling again because of uh, the amount of travel we normally do. And Candace's comment was, well, you, you realize it doesn't matter where we fly from South Africa, um, there will be a prejudice to the fact that you've come from, from Africa, so the testing and the requirements will be tougher. And I think the, the, the comment that I wanted to bring into the context of governance for, for us having a conversation between South Africa uh, and Canada specifically is our company law um, and the genesis of it is all from the same thing. And so when we talk about governance uh, cross-border, when we talk about climate governance cross-border, let's make sure we don't project onto each other what we expect each other should be doing. And on that note, um, I'm, I'm going to hand back uh, to Janice to lead us through uh, the, the, the next part of the conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie and Lisette and Carl. I think you've got us off to a good start. And what I love is this idea of the commonalities between the Global North and the Global South and what we in North America and in Canada in particular can learn. Um, so Stephanie uh, has posted, I think, to all of you um, some resources that you can uh, share um, and learn about uh, her embedding project, uh, Next Generation of Governance, uh, and uh, a really ambitious and wonderful project uh, that uh, the Canada Climate Law Initiative very much supports. Um, so I'm going to move to the next segment of this um, program. Um, if you can have the next slide up, please, Charles. Um, so we're moving from business to the written word. And this uh, segment talks about how emerging world literature can offer insights or inform our thinking on fighting climate change. And I'm pleased to welcome as our two speakers, Dr. Mendissa Harhoff, who is an English language and literature um, uh, study, uh, studies professor at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And uh, we matched her with Alexander Sarah Davis, who is a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto. So please take it away. Thank you. Hi, Janet. I'm guessing you're going ahead. Yeah. Yes, please. Okay, I'll just get started since I opened my mouth first. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Um, I've titled my very short uh, presentation, Itchy Creature, uh, looking at Neddy Okarofor's Lagoon. And let's start. Timer. Yeah, um, and I'm centering this idea of it, she, and creature, this idea of um, kind of like othering and separation and how uh, Nnedi Akorofo invites us to rethink that. Um, and also just like at large or in general, how echo fiction or climate fiction um, in the African continent invites a kind of like uh, illuminates the destabilization of these um, of these kind of like separations and binaries between what is assumed to be nature and what is assumed to be human and what is assumed to be animal as if these are disparate um, things. Um, I also just kind of like the the idea of echo fiction as not something that is new but as something that has always 
been very much at the heart of um, African literature, African film. Um, I think of farm novels, uh, which is my area of focus, um, and how they are grounded in the landscape and the kind of like interrelation between human beings and the land and the animal and the very survival or the very identity of being as um, one that is intric intricately tied to the land. Um, and so novels um, like Efuru by Flora Nwapa out of, uh, out of um, Nigeria also kind of center the question of gender. Um, and so this like separation, um, it, they, they all resist the separation between um, the kind of idea of the species. Um, it's um, it's uh, Axel Carrera I draw from who writes that the Anthropocene lays bare the intricate interrelatedness among humans, non-human life, and geophysical processes that the sustained um, cultivation of its affiliated ethos encourages the effective shift necessary to survive both its precarious times and the multiple forms of vulnerabilities it inaugurated. Um, so by inviting us to consider this idea of other um, that, that often kind of like separates us, uh, what climate, what this knowledge, it's emerging knowledges on climate and climate change or the Anthropocene um, have brought into sharp view is that there aren't, there aren't very, that, that by thinking of ourselves in separation, uh, we also enforce kind of violences, right? Uh, but rather that the shift that needs to happen is to move away from the concept of the other or the concept of separation between nature and human. So in Nedi Okarofor's Lagoon, what Africa um, offers is within the kind of like mythological scope of African spirituality, African thinkings around being, there is no separation between the human and the earth or spirit, right? And what this particular um, historical moment invites is a thinking, an add-on of technology, but also the effect of environmental, uh, of violence to the environment, to the kind of like new body or the new being. So in the novel, there is an alien arrival um, that arrives in the waters of Lagos, Nigeria, um, and they kind of spill into the everyday lives of all of these people, um, and their everyday lives are marked by uh, queer quest questions of LGBTQ questions, um, gendered questions, domestic violence questions, religion questions. And so this alien invasion is an extension of existing forms of otherness that need to be addressed when we consider the question of climate and the question of change and the question of transformation. These aliens name themselves as the change. Um, and in order for them to impose this impending change, they are inviting the humans to participate with them in what will happen in any case. And I consider this invitation to participation as one that invites us right as readers and as thinkers to consider how when we ask the climate question we are also asking the gender question we are asking the race question we are asking the capitalist question we are asking coal questions we are asking oil questions that it is not just a matter of human beings engaging with the question of the climate as if it is something outside of all of the other vulnerabilities that have been inaugurated by what we now know as the Anthropocene moment. Um, one of the things, um, as my time ends, one of the things that the alien says when one of the children asks, are you an alien, just to kind of come back to the idea of African mythology as generative for thinking about how to address climate questions, uh, the alien named Ayodele says, um, by your definition, yes. And the little one asks, well, how come you look human? Um, and 
she responds, would you rather I didn't? Um, and the little one says, why not appear as yourself? And she responds, human beings have a hard time relating to that which does not resemble them. It's your greatest flaw. And I think if we center on this idea that we have a hard time, human beings have a hard time relating to that which does not resemble them, um, to think of human beings also um, violate that which does not resemble them because the justification is that it is not of us and it is not us, um, then there's a certain kind of justification, which is how we arrived here. And um, the African continent, the literary landscape, the visual landscape offers multiple generative examples for how we can rethink, um, we, can, we can draw from Africa examples of how we are interrelated and interconnected and our survival, our collective survival relies on this. Um, and in our participating with nature, in our participating with all the various forms uh, of being that exist in the world. Thank you. Thank I'll you, stop Doc. there for now. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Harhoff. Um, so I'm actually going to be building off of some of what Mandisa has said and some of what Carl shared in the last section of the seminar today. Uh, my talk is, is titled Opposing Models of Development in Recent Global Anglophone Novels. Um, so in her book, Death of a Discipline, Gyatri Chakravorty Spivak writes, in this era of global capital triumphant, to keep responsibility alive in the reading and teaching of the textual is at first sight impractical. It is, however, the right of the textual to be so responsible, responsive, answerable. So Spivak is talking about the need for educators to keep the study of literature responsible, but her words function also as the case for an understanding of literature as a medium through which we as a species take responsibility for our actions, respond to them, and make ourselves answerable for their consequences. So today I'll be following her assertion of the responsibility of the textual by showing you two radically different visions of our world from the last decade and examining what those two texts have to say about the ongoing industrialization and so-called development processes of the world, as well as the violent and destructive outcomes of climate change that those processes are causing. You may be surprised to hear that the first of those books, Mohsen Hamid's 2013 novel, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, is styled as a self-help book. The opening pages of the text promise, as does the title, to instruct the reader in how to capitalize on the economic development and required exploitation of natural resources that is taking place on that side of the world. The text is written in the second person, but the focalizing subject is not exactly us, the reader. Instead, the novel's you appears to be a young boy born to a poor rural family in a country that remains unnamed. The text follows the boy as he leaves the countryside for the big city, earns precarious employment, and grows into a man. We watch as Yu attempts to pull his family out of poverty, though his meager earnings cannot save them from poor living conditions and illness. Though his parents do not live to see his success, Yu continues to climb a socioeconomic ladder, a new one, even as it is being built, hovering across the edges of legality and morality in order to conduct brisk business. Moving from the sale of goods to the filling of gas tanks, and then again into the bottling and sourcing of fresh water, Yu eventually finds himself as a sort of tycoon, complete in his domination of the industry, ruthless in his destruction of the opposition, and resourceful in his greasing of the relevant palms. But before the novel ends, you will lose it all. His wife, his children, his fortune. While Hamid's How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia initially appears as a guide to economic and ecological exploitation, it reveals itself in the final chapters as a tragedy. The story of a you whose strategies and systems for controlling the world falter, and who is outcompeted by ever newer, ever more ruthless yous to come. By contrast, 
Shivangi Swarup's Latitudes of Longing, published in 2018, is pleasant and picaresque as its narrative floats from one tableau of character dramas to another, each section of the novel named after a different natural landscape. Swarup's text is simultaneously more and less universalizing than Hamid's portrayal of a developing world. Whereas Filthy Rich monopolizes the second person and shies away from naming specific people and places, Latitudes of Longing achieves this sense of universality by switching its third person perspective from named character to named character and named place to named place, frequently exchanging whole castes and regions of India for others, as of then unmentioned counterparts. The first sections arguing newlyweds are replaced by the aging great grandfather who struggles to accept the world his world is becoming with the details and the stakes of their stories shifting just as dramatically. But one commonality is the presence of the earth, of nature, as both a conceptual point of reference and a linguistic thread that cannot be untangled from the novel substance. Natural images and patterns are as embedded in the speakerless language of the narrator as they are in the thoughts of the characters that narration describes. The prisoners fleeing a prison are ants pouring chaotically from their hill. The rain season of a tropical island is the mental state of lovers who will not sleep in the same bed. A winter's snow dusted night is the ghost of a man who saved the grandfather's life. These linguistic and conceptual entanglements demonstrate latitudes of longings uh, commitment to portraying lives as inseparable from their settings and people as unquestionably interconnected with their environments. I have aimed this brief overview of recent novels at achieving two goals. First, to illustrate the wide range in discussions of the human earth relationship in global anglophone literature. And second, to highlight one alternative that both texts propose to the vision of development that we see privileged in discourses of industry, economy, and policy. Both How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia and Latitudes of Longing end with cyclical models we find in our partners and families, the relationships of love and the habits of care that improve and extend the lives of those they touch. Mohsen Hamid's you has lost his fortune, his empire, and his legacy. He spends the final years of his life with a partner he long loved but did not pursue. And having to fail or having failed to properly follow her across chapters of the book and his life, the self-help book author acknowledges that you has finally exceeded the boundaries of yourself and can confront the imminent end with new insight and courage and connect with those that you love. Each section of Shibangi Swarup's novel ends with the reaffirmation of such care, such movement beyond the self. And the final pages issue characters all together in order to compare the meeting of the sun and the moon in the twilight sky with the relationship between an author and her readers and the possibility of a new world and an alternative model of development that such literary relationships can promise. And so I'll end again with Spivak just as I began. She writes, I propose the planet to overwrite the globe. Globalization is the impos imposition of the same system of exchange everywhere. In the grid work of electronic capital, we achieve that abstract ball covered in latitudes and longitudes, cut by virtual lines, once the equator and the tropics and so on, now drawn by the requirements of geographical information systems. The globe is on our computers. No one lives there. It allows us to think we can aim to control it. The planet is in the species of alterity, belonging to another, and yet we inhabit it on loan. Thank you both. That was uh, very enlightening. We've had several requests uh, for a reading list. Uh, so we're going to ask you to do that and we'll send it out to the uh, almost 100 people that registered for this. Uh, lots to think about in terms of literature. Uh, so Charles, next slide, please. Um, so we're going to turn now to the visual arts and how they inspire us in terms of using introspection and empathy to conceptualize and press for transformation. And I'll preview that visually this one's very appealing. Um, so I, for those of you that don't use webinars too often, if you're seeing speakers 
speakers on the right and the screens on the left. If you want a bigger screen, there's a couple of bars in the middle and you can move to make the visuals much bigger and all of us uh, speaking heads much smaller. I also want to remind you that uh, all of the speakers are going to come back on at the very end and answer your questions. So please post them in the question and answer box and we promise we'll answer as many as we can. Uh, so it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce our next two speakers. Uh, Dr. Kim Berman, who is a professor of visual art at the University of Johannesburg in South Africa, and Rene Mathib, who is the education manager of Artist Proof Studio in South Africa. And in preparation for this webinar, we have had a lot of fun collaborating south and north. So please uh, welcome Kim and Renee. Thank you very much, Janice. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I don't see Renee. Is she on? Um, yes, I'm here. Okay. I'm here. <laughs> there you go. All right. Yes. Um, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think um, I'm, we're going to present a, a portfolio of, of work in response to Janice's invitation. Um, but I'm going to start with, with introducing the project for the first 10 minutes, followed by, by Renee. Um, and I, I guess I'm starting with a question. What do the arts have to do with climate change, law, and policymaking? Why are we here? In this forum, presenting artwork from printmaking students in Johannesburg, alongside lawmakers, scientists, and economists. Artist Proof Studio is a center of education and skills development for young and talented artists who do not have the finances or the ability to access further education. Artist Proof Studio raises funds to subsidize the training and development of artists with passion and talent. The national lockdown has been exceptionally devastating for these artists. Many of them live in poverty. Today we're presenting a portfolio of 15 artworks by students who've responded to the burning question of climate change from the position of a national lockdown due to the COVID-19 pandemic. If you do the next slide, please. What do young artists have to say about living in a reality with no running water during lockdown? So as, as Tabo Skusana's work on the, the left-hand side describes with the image at the top of Lady Justice crumbling, and he talks about having no water, or of one young artist who survived this period of lockdown in a home with his father, whose 21 years of abuse led to the recent death of his mother or the student that had to sell his phone for food and lost the ability to connect to his classes or peers. What do these voices have to do with us or with this conference or with climate change? As an educator, artist and academic, I find myself asking how we can, can we begin to address the structural violence of poverty, abuse and environmental neglect that young people are facing? How can we create safe spaces and the opportunity for our students to express their fears, dreams, and realities? Our students speak through their artworks and I believe are among those voices that must be heard. This forum presents the challenge to engage with emerging voices that are expressed in a rich visual language of symbolism and metaphor using found and available art materials. Young voices represent our future. They will inherit the policies that perpetuate economic, gender, and environmental injustice. So when Professor Janice Sarah invited Artist Proof Studio to be part of this conference, I jumped at the opportunity. I had collaborated with Janice and other of her colleagues before, both at, at the Peter Wall Institute and more recently on a book called Changing Our Worlds, where we presented the conviction that transformative art practices are not only therapeutic and important for healing, but can be directed to structural, mm -hmm. social, and economic change. 
including the arts on a panel, as an integral part of understanding climate change. And, in, sorry, including the arts on a panel such as this is integral to understanding climate change attests to the understanding that a visionary approach is needed to influence policymakers. When artists are included, they bring a range of values, including aesthetics, multiple modalities, imagination, alchemy, reciprocity, all qualities that deepen and, and enrich understandings and ultimately social change outcomes. So the next slide um, introduces the lockdown collection, or as we call it, the TLC, which is a visual art response that supports vulnerable artists impacted by the South African lockdown. It was founded by three innovators, a business entrepreneur, Carl Bates, who you heard earlier in the first panel, um, a marketing specialist, Lauren Wolf, and myself. The Lockdown Collection used artists' work to raise over two and a half million rand, which I, I think is about 200, 200 Canadian dollars, 100,000 Canadian dollars. And this has helped or enabled us to award over 420 grants to vulnerable artists so far. And I think this was a campaign where artists contributed work in, in their portfolios, which is shown there, that was sold on auction. And then subsequent to that, another um, two portfolios plus work by William Kentridge contributed to this campaign. And when Janice saw the impact of this campaign, she invited Arts Proof Studio and allocated part of her research grant to produce a portfolio of students' visual voices responding to the vision of green renewal. Her brief asked for images that, quote, convey either the devastating effect of climate change and or a hopeful vision for how we transition the world to meet the challenges. So th I think we can go to the next slide. I, I invited a young climate change activist, Maru At Atwood, to share her experience of environmental activism and to work with the teachers and students to deepen their understandings of the UN development goals, which seek to transform food and agriculture in Africa to be more resilient, equitable, inclusive and environmentally, socially and economically sustainable. She and the teachers engage with students on their ideas for communities to help develop their own environmental recovery plans. She recorded moving interviews with the students that accompany this portfolio. And I think we have the link of the YouTube in the, in the chat box. The images by these artists express their instability, resilience, anger, innovation, and hope. They provide a lens to engaging with the world in change. Their visions are not about rainbows towards a post-COVID future but about an ongoing present and hard lessons of renewal adjustments and change for changes for our generation to address. We listen to the scientists who provide the hard statistics about the pandemic and climate change. Their warnings elicit fear and uncertainty. They stimulate extreme anxiety and mental instability. The lack of human connection during the lockdown has also increased these feelings of alienation and despair. But as the challenge of this conference proposes, let us not make the mistake of aspiring to go back to how things were before the pandemic, but to actively engage possibilities for a new future. Artists can lead the way in the search for new and tested and imaginative possibilities for change. The arts nurture and enliven our humanity. They facilitate the imagination, enrich resilience, and create spaces for hope. We all experience this in some way during our individual lockdown experiences. People have found great comfort through listening to music, reading literature, seeing extraordinary theater, 
and visiting virtual galleries everywhere in the world on their electronic devices. So the next slide introduces the climate change and the hope for a green recovery portfolio. Artivism is a term used to describe activism through art. The art students represented in this green renewal portfolio see themselves as agents for change. The voices of the student artists enable us to hear and see the urgent calls for renewal, the complexity and the agency to transform the challenge of hardship into one of opportunity. The visual art campaign will also be posted daily on social media for the next two weeks following today's launch as a call to members of the public to engage with and support change. Please also follow us on the Artist Proof Studio Instagram and Facebook and website pages. So for, for a thousand rand or 80 Canadian dollars, you can purchase a single print to support the campaign for these and other vulnerable artists to sustain themselves in their practice. Each work is a reminder of what we need to do to make changes in our own lives. Our hope is that these artworks can assist in contributing to the vision for environmental and economic activism and justice. So thank you for the opportunity. I'm now going to hand over to Renee, who's going to take you through the portfolio. And we're going to also put the, the link for the Artist Proof Studio website for you to place an order on any of the works you may be interested in. So Renee, would you like to turn on your, yes. your video and I'm handing to you. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, so Charles, if you can play the video, I'll be going through the, the works just now. Not everything, but just a few of them. young artists from Artist Proof Studio in Johannesburg, South Africa, rose to the call to make these works to inspire action against the ever-growing climate crisis and to ensure an environmentally sustainable recovery in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Here, a few of them tell their stories behind the works, how climate change and other environmental issues are impacting their communities and their visions for a green renewal. Their calls for urgent and meaningful climate action through these artworks should not, and indeed cannot, be ignored. Thank you. You can continue playing. My name is Buti Malele Toko. I'm a visual fine artist currently residing in Soweto. My work, Koshushu 2, is a parcel word which means it is hot it mainly focuses on the basis of the extreme heat wave that increases each year and this causes drought and with drought it causes the lack of food growing proper in my neighborhood i can see how climate change actually affects the people there's so many people cramped up into one small space the whole place it's just really polluted. I feel like climate change really affects that area the most because when summer comes and it rains, there are the people that are flooded because their houses are not even structured well and the place just turns into a turmoil. With that being, you can tell that the climate change crisis is getting even worse because now our government does not take climate change crisis that's serious. That is the problem. We don't take action as soon as possible to save the earth because I feel that in time, it might have gone even worse than we expected it would be. Citizens as well should take part into saving the earth. And this is the earth that we live on and we wouldn't want to harm it with climate change and intensive heat even more and make us suffer. That's what I actually fear. Thank you. You can go to the next slide. Um, so this is Clement Mohale and he's in his first year and his work um, is titled From Nature We Take and From Nature We Give. Uh, the work addresses the water shortages and challenges which still persist in most African countries. 
um, the COVID-19 pandemic highlighted this issue when, school, when schools were planned to reopen and the government had to install water tanks in most schools that had no running water. So he's talking about the many lives that are still affected by the access to improved uh, drinking water. Uh, next slide. Renee, your sound quality is really bad. I wonder if you can move closer to your mic. Maybe that would help. My, my screen. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe let me switch off my video. Okay, so this is Cynthia and she was born in the Congo and she's currently living um, in Johannesburg. Uh, she's doing her third year at Artist Proof Studio. Um, in this work, we see a lavish home that's uh, in a state of emergency. Um, it's flooded. And she's talking about um, how the devastating floods have been almost been, um, we've only been seeing them in most uh, poor communities. And here she changes the narrative where she's talking about how everyone um, will be affected by the climate change. Um, next slide. Uh, Spusiso is also in his third year and this is a photograph that he took um, of where he lives. He says that his home is a dumping ground for human waste um, it is a squatter camp where there is no evidence of nature anywhere. Uh, the next slide, please. Lucky is also in his third year, and this work um, highlights the effects of human uh, of burning coal, oil, and tires. The state has failed to provide sustainable energy leading to load shedding. He says that most townships are left to make their own way in making sure that they have heat and light. The work is titled, Let There Be Light. Next slide, please. To serve us work shows um, the future weather conditions in our, in our continent. Um, he says that climate change will have devastating effects and impact on our weather in Africa. The next one, please. Uh, Simpiwe um, is a graduate uh, at APS and she's currently doing her fourth year internship. And she imagines a world where plants have clean air and water, where we can see a polluted world in contrast to a lavish um, and beautiful fauna and flora around it. Um, next slide, please. Amanda is currently doing her third year and her work addresses the issue of pollution and the greenhouse gases that are trapped um, in the atmosphere, harming most of our agriculture. Next one. Jason Langa is in first year and his work is titled Greener Pastures. Uh, this work focuses on promoting habits which could slow down or halt the effects of climate change. And then next slide, please, and then you can play the video. My name is Tumis Ankaliko. I'm a Johannesburg based artist. I'm a photographer and a visual artist. For me, creating this work, I was looking at how the loss of animals during this course of chemical pollutions happens. I was trying actually to capture around a home loss for these animals and the water pollution. I think for us to take care of our planet is to take more precautions on our health on or how are we actually have to deal with the climate change or the water pollution. Uh, Tim, did you want to uh, wind up the session uh, with a few remarks?
your mic is uh, muted. I'm on. I'm still I'm still on mute. No, you're good. Okay, so thank you very much. I, as I said, I think that we'll just let the the work sit and and speak for itself for now, and then when it's a question time, if anybody's got any questions, we can we can address them then. Thank you. Renee and Kim, thank you so very much. Uh, very powerful images. Uh, the longer video that they have has each of the artists speaking about what motivated them. And I learned a lot from that 14 minute video that you didn't see about what, uh, what it, the images mean for them and what they represent. So the links are up and uh, please do to support the Visual uh, Distressed Artists Fund. Uh, so our next up uh, final uh, is, uh, um, looking at music uh, in terms of the contribution of music in facilitating innovative public policy thinking on climate. Um, so I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Helen Eastman, uh, who is a director and playwright. Uh, she teaches at Oxford University and does many other things. It would take me the entire time to tell you about them. And, uh, and also Alex Silverman, who is a composer and music director uh, from, the Ox from Oxford in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, let me uh, just say that um, we will, uh, just to repeat, we will open it up for Q&A after this last segment. Uh, so please uh, post your questions in the questions and answer. Um, I wanna, just before I turn it over, I wanna make sure I am thanking very sincerely the students who contributed their ideas and the visuals uh, to this student competition. Uh, very powerful um, and something that opens up, I think, our horizons about how we should be thinking about climate change and how we should be thinking about a green recovery. Uh, so, Helen, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Janice. Um, just checking that I'm, uh, you can all hear me there? Am I uh, perfectly unmuted? I can hear you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you, Janice. And I just wanted to say an incredible thank you, really, for all the work you do in bringing together these cross-disciplinary conversations. That's going to be a bit of a theme of what I'm going to say, that without these conversations that spread across uh, a wide range of backgrounds and uh, disciplines and academic backgrounds, we cannot tackle climate change. So I think we all want to thank um, Janice for her role in bringing us all together in this kind of conversation. Um, halfway through this talk, uh, Alex and I are going to share with you a film that we have made. Uh, it's a collaboration between my organisation Live Canon and the Canada Climate, uh, uh, the Canada Climate Law Initiative um, Janice, that Janice is working with, and it's called Time for Hope. Um, and it's launched today. Um, and before we share that with you, we're just going to give you a little bit of a context about uh, why we made it and how we've made it. And then afterwards, we're going to tell you a bit about how you can get involved with the project once you've seen the film. Um, I first worked with Janice on a project called Foreclosure Follies, where we brought together lawyers, economists, bankers to, with artists to have conversations in lots of different ways about fairness in financial futures. It was a cross-disciplinary knowledge exchange conference when we started it, and like all good cross-disciplinary conferences, it uh, resulted in us creating a cabaret which toured around the world to lots of different financial districts um, and was performed by a range of company directors, economists, lawyers, bankers and actors. It was one of the most extraordinary projects I've been involved with in my career because it brought together people from such diverse backgrounds to have conversations that are essential. People who often speak in their own bubbles, economists speak to economists, financiers speak to financiers, artists speak to artists, we're finally coming together and broadening the conversation. And what we all took away from that was absolutely essential. So when Janice asked me to work with the Canada Climate Law Initiative on ways to use the arts to create dialogue between stakeholders in the climate conversation, company directors, scientists, academics, economists, artists, I was absolutely, definitely in. Um, I've spent 20 years working in the arts as a writer, director, lyricist on a very wide range of projects. But I haven't let go of my conviction that the arts have a fundamental role in society to make change and that artists have a duty to use their ability to communicate 
be that through words or music or visual images where they can to help society navigate the big questions. There isn't a bigger or more pressing question than climate change. It affects every single person on the planet. And it's a really hard story to tell. Um, my job is telling stories, and this one is really impossible from our vantage point right in the center of it. For so long, we thought, is climate change happening? Is this happening? And then suddenly the narrative was it's happening and it's overwhelming. Our job is to make sure that people don't feel overwhelmed and can take action. To keep telling a story that is a story of hope, of the joy in collaborative and communal action, to ward off despair, and to encourage people to use their imaginations to imagine the world as we might want it to be. Um, as we do that, we are up against a lot of other narratives, which are the people in whose interest it is to say that this is not happening or that there's nothing we can do. There are so many companies, media outlets, influential people, presidential candidates for whom it is advantageous to tell us that we can't make change. And I hope that our film encourages people the opposite, that we can all be part of a new way of living and a new direction. So uh, when we have those conversations, it really matters who our audiences are and who's in the room having them. And so projects like the ones that Janice has been setting up, which bring together such a wide range of people into the dialogue are absolutely essential because this is not a problem that we can solve without a wide range of expertise. We need company directors to talk to scientists, we need scientists to talk to communicators, and we need artists to keep insisting that we have those conversations. We were working on the idea of community meetings, which brought together grassroots communities and used both the experts in the room and the artists in the room to communicate questions in new ways and to fill people with joy and positivity to go out of the room and make a difference. Then lockdown happened and it was absolutely impossible that we could convene people to have community meetings. So when we made this film, we had to think about different ways of community building and how from our lockdowns all over the world, we could bring people together to commit to making changes in the face of climate change. And when you see the film, you'll be able to judge how successful we've been in doing that. Um, I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, Alex Silverman, who's gonna talk more specifically as a composer about the role of music in this whole endeavor. So over to Alex. Uh, I think I'm unmuted now. Thank you, Helen. It's, um, yeah, I'm just gonna give it a couple of minutes or talk a little bit about the sort of context. It's quite a big idea, really, the contribution of music in facilitating innovative public policy thinking on climate. Thanks, Janice, for that title, um, I, which, I, which made me laugh and then cry, uh, but also think really hard about the mission that we've been on for a very long time, which is uh, addressing climate change one song at a time. Um, Helen and I have been writing songs about this issue, I think, for more than 10 years now. Um, so the song you're here going to hear later today is, in fact, it's only one of two of those songs that I think are going to find a public uh, this month. And that is not uh, to do it down. It just so happens that this work is it's urgent. It's now and it's coming a lot in different media, um, despite our, our copious uh, output in this uh, particular arena. Um, you will have noticed, I think, that there aren't exactly hundreds of chart-topping climate anthems out there. Um, and this one probably isn't going to reach number one on six continents. But that's really not the point. And I've, been, I've enjoyed thinking about that and, uh, and understanding that a little bit. Um, there are mass market commercial songs that address man-made climate change. Um, believe it or not, they do exist. I've done a little bit of digging, um, but you won't find in the commercial market, which is to say in pop music, more than one a year that actually sells a meaningful number of records. So Billie Eilish had a record in 2019 that sold quite a few, um, that talked about California fires, but was very much packaged as being about sex. Uh, Childish Gambino had a record in 2018 uh, called Feels Like Summer, which was uh, about everything getting hotter, but is also has a message about uh, anger and Black Lives Matter and, and representation, um, which is an interesting pattern and, and so on and so on and so on and so on, um, which is that the work that has the greatest reach, which is so commercially um, promoted, um, it very rarely touches on this subject, which of course it touches everybody. And when it does, uh, the climate agenda really often fights for space with other ideas, which is partly a commercial hedge 
because imagery related to heat and getting warmer doubles really easily for the more bankable ideas, um, particularly ones about love or uh, relationships or anger. Um, and the bottom line is a factor. So companies that promote songs in general are very risk averse and profit driven. So they don't push campaigns uh, until the point where they feel that the message of those of those songs reflects values that their customers already hold, which is to say, I'm going to have to keep writing songs about climate change until uh, the record companies uh, finally decide that, that enough people want to hear about climate change uh, that they can pay one of their stars to do it. Um, but I don't mind that, that's fine. Um, it is very hard to change someone's mind with a song and we keep trying to do it, but uh, I don't think that's a problem either because there are very few ways um, of expressing solidarity that are better than singing together. Uh, and that I think is something that lots of people who participated in this project um, have found and I learn every time we do something like this, which is when you share a song and then you someone sings it back to you, you, you make a connection. And that is why we, we do this, is to be connected and to share our agreement. Um, it's about consensus and consonants. Uh, the agreement that you have over an idea is amplified by the words and the notes that sound together. It's an active business. You don't just receive a song in this way, um, but it's very participatory and it requires a physical engagement, which is which is great. If you want to be active in your activism, uh, singing a song together is, is absolutely the way uh, to do that. And even when singing when you're angry definitely makes you feel better. Um, in the spirit of this north-south gathering, I've been thinking about, and I've always, I'm always interested in my work in the idea of, of universality, of singability. If I sing you a tune and we have nothing else culturally in common, can you sing it back to me? And that is something we can talk about a little bit later, but that was a, a re an idea that was uh, fundamental to the making of this particular song, Time for Hope, which that I had set out initially to write a melody using as few notes as possible, uh, using, which is to say, a pentatonic scale, which appears in, uh, which is used in and traces back in lots of different cultures across the world. And you can find um, ways of, of expressing yourself uh, in that which translate very easily. Um, and I mean, it's a fallacy. There is no such thing as, I don't think, as a melodic universality, but it is really fun and uh, to find, to look for the things that you can share with other humans. Uh, and a song like this uh, gives us a little glimpse of that, of a common language where we can start to express ourselves, even though the, the language of our protest is English. Uh, there's still something in the music that, it, that we have attempted to draw people from across different cultures. Um, so, I mean, tying up some of these thoughts, uh, I'm going to have to write a lot more of these songs, probably. I hope you enjoy this one while it's here. Um, and, and I hope that you agree with me that, uh, that this is a really helpful thing uh, to do, that these songs can, can be helpful in building agreement and galvanising voices and bodies in a cause that is unquestionably really important to everybody uh, right now. I think that we do need lots more songs like this about climate crisis. Uh, and the more people sing together and make it clear that this is something worth singing about, the more likely we are one day to see that reflected in decisions uh, at the top of uh, particularly the companies that sell us culture. Um, but I think that happens uh, as well. That might be reflected across law and other aspects of, uh, of governance so that, that this, this has to build from the bottom up as well as from the top down. Um, I hope you very much enjoy the uh, song and I hope that we can hear lots more people uh, singing it or inspired to sing it or to make their own songs uh, and one day I will uh, I won't have to write any more of them. <laughs> Thank you Alex. Um, at the end of the playing of the song I'm going to tell you how you can sing this song and get involved in it. Um, what we wanted to create was a song that was um, different every time it was sung because it reflected the group of people singing it. So we've made a song that has um, a chorus that is always the same but where you might find a verse in a normal song structure, instead, there are a series of pledges made by the people singing the song. And in that moment, they will pledge their own commitment to a change in their life. It might be a change in their personal life or a change in their corporate life or a change that their whole company might make, but it is a commitment to a change that they will make. So every time this song is sung by a different group of people, a different choir, a different community, it will be different because the commitments that that community are prepared to make will be different. And this particular version is the lockdown version. So this is sung by a global choir who've been brought together 
digitally from their lockdowns all over the world. We hope in the future life of this song that it will not always be sung <laughs> digitally and stitched together, but it will be sung by real people singing together in real places. But every time this song is uh, sung, it will contain a whole new set of commitments to our planet. So um, it opens with a dedication uh, in Haida, an indigenous language, uh, which um, reflects upon the fact that there is much that we can learn from indigenous peoples about how to look after our beautiful planet. So Charles, please, will you play the video for us? Thank you. by donating to environmental justice organizations. I pledge not to buy any products containing coal or peat. To unplug my phones and other devices after a full charge. Conserve water. I pledge not to eat meat. I pledge to be the earth as sacred. To cut down on single-use plastic and to recycle more. To eat vegan at least one day every week. To put my refillable water bottle and my reusable coffee cup in my bag every day. I pledge to protect the earth. I pledge to cycle and walk more and use polluting transport less. To be more conscious about the amount of water that I use. To keep aiming for 100% solar electricity. To use only LED light bulbs from now on. I pledge to organize against environmental racism in my city. Time for change must start with you and me. Time for what's the world you want to see? Time for hope. There is no planet B. I'm decisively shape the future, hopefully. I pledge to go by bike. I pledge to be a water detector. Reducing, reusing, and recycling in the use of plastics. I pledge to protect every bee that lives in my garden. I pledge to have my savings only in responsible investment funds. To be more eco-friendly by reducing my plastic usage. To use public transport whenever I want to go anywhere and to walk to work. and insect friendly. I pledge to plant one tree by year. To raise my toddler in a climate change conscious household. To spread words about climate change to my friends and teachers. I pledge to avoid buying single-use plastic where possible. I pledge to stop doing half loan of laundry. I pledge to stop buying bottled water and to conserve all other water that I use in the future. I pledge to get drastic on plastic by shopping with reusable bags, avoiding plastic packaging, and always bringing my own bottle. I pledge that when I grow up, I will be an eco-scientist and uh, help their world with environmental friendly new gadgets. Bye. 
Thank you very much, um, Charles, for playing that for us. Um, and an enormous thank you to everybody who contributed to that. Um, obviously, as you can see, it was made uh, during the lockdown. So everybody who contributed um, followed some detailed instructions from us on how to uh, sing along to the track, film themselves, record themselves while listening to the backing track and did so with um, enormous uh, generosity. So if you want to get involved, um, We've made two ways that people can now take this song and make it their own. One way people can get involved is by just sending us a pledge that they would like to make on behalf of themselves or their company. And we are keeping a gallery of pledges on our website, on, uh, which is livecanon.co.uk forward slash hope. Um, and there we're starting to keep a gallery of, um, there are also extended versions of a lot of the pledges we couldn't fit in the song because some people made brilliant uh, but lengthy pledges and we could only take a snippet to go in the song, otherwise it would have been 20 minutes long so you can watch their pledges in full on our website and you can contribute your own but the other way to get involved which we hope people will do is they'll now sing the song uh, be it with their class at school or be it with the choir they sing with the congregation they sing with their workplace choir um, and in the process of rehearsing it they will then work out what their pledges as a community are and what the individual members of their community are going to stand up and commit to. Um, and so there's a backing track that people can download, there's sheet music they can download so they can get involved in any way they can. I'm just going to pass over to Alex who's going to give advice to anybody who's going to sing the song. Uh, yes, I mean I, I think you've said it all actually Helen, which is uh, please go to www.livecanon.co.uk slash hope uh and have another look at the video because uh, we like big numbers uh and uh, yeah download the backing track uh, featuring uh, the glorious uh fiddling of uh, patsy reed uh, and check her out online uh, if you're feeling generous because uh, uh musicians don't have enough gigs um and uh, yeah so you can download the backing track and um and sing along uh and make your own pledges in the middle and obviously we're we're delighted to receive um uh, and those versions and post them, film them, record them. We'll, we'll try and uh, keep a, a gallery of them. I mean, it'd be lovely to keep building more and more um, versions of it. Um, it should, as Helen said, it's designed to be, well, there's, there's, you can all now sing the chorus. Uh, don't, because it'll cause a, a sort of ruction on Zoom. Um, but hopefully by now you've all learned that. But uh, And then there's space for you all to make your own pledges um, at some considerable length in the end and um and we hope we'll see those uh soon uh, but not just from you but obviously from everybody you know all over the world um so thank you very much thanks to alex and thank you very much um uh janice and to uh joanne for organizing this and i think we're now about to move on to questions yes we are so um i'll just ask all the uh speakers to turn their cameras back on uh and uh we uh we have a few minutes for questions but we're gonna wind up uh, promptly on time as promised. Uh, well, just put them in the Q&A box, please. And this one is, is uh, one that just uh, anyone of you could answer. So I'll just ask somebody to step up. And that is, uh, in this time of lockdown, how do we use the arts to reach powerful decision makers in business, government, and banks? So who wants to step up? Helen. Um, so uh, the first way is to get um, Janice to get those people in a room um, and, and let us sing at them. I found this to be very effective uh, uh, over the last five years in my collaboration with um, uh, Dr. Sarah. So that's definitely um, one way. The other thing is to remember, I think, that decision makers are just human beings and, and culture reaches them. So... Um, uh, deep down, you know, once you start actually talking to people who are making decisions at a systemic level or they are all also um, members of community of society, they are parents, they are um, ferocious readers of novels. Um, and so we um, uh, have to permeate culture so it reaches people and we have to reach out and have those 
conversations and uh, try and keep those conversations going in 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 public ways. But um, personally, I found one of the most effective, if possibly slightly manipulative ways to have those conversations with people across disciplines is to connect to people as parents. Because for me, the, the biggest um, uh, emotional impact of most things about climate change on me comes when I when I consider them my role as a parent to uh, hand over a planet to my children that is livable on. Um, and so sometimes the things that connect us across the different ways we work and the different disciplines we work are, are um, important. The other thing that I think is really important and when we're talking to children and young people is to remind them of the power of their communication. I read a brilliant article about 45 minutes before this started about how Lego have just decided that they will no longer put Lego in plastic packaging because they have received so many letters from children that they now can no longer possibly continue to put Lego in plastic bags. And that's a great thing to remind people that uh, decision makers um, need to be told by their consumers or by their, their public um, uh, what decisions we want them to make so you know if you haven't ever rung up your pension fund and told them where you want your pension invested then 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 you haven't communicated that that is what you require of them in their decision making so um i think that's really important as well stephanie maybe i can just ask you this do the same question before we move on to the next one yeah i'm just struck by um the the visceral reaction that we're all having to the art and and to the music and so i think um you know the work that in the research that we've done with how do you um create influence and change within corporate boardrooms and executive teams it, it's exactly that it's it's um uh you know i think one of the ceos that i spoke with said it very poignantly which is um you don't become a ceo or you don't end up on a board if you're not a systems thinker, it's a question of the system and what you see is the system that you need to manage. And so I think these are, are ways to, to help corporate leaders and, and, and government and policymakers realize that the system that they need to manage is a much bigger system than they had thought before. But the key is um, once you see that, you can't unsee it. And so then immediately your mind goes to trying to find the tools to deal with it. And so I think this is, this is very powerful. And, um, you know, as, as we've been going along here, I've, I've been uh, tweeting out and trying to share this song with the corporate community and engage them in trying to think about um, singing it, um, sharing their own pledges, and also um, purchasing these beautiful prints. So, so thank you for bringing these ideas together. Thank you. Um, this one isn't really a question, but Karis Bailey writes that um, um, that a project has started to raise money and awareness through, around social issues in South Africa through art. Um, and it's an ex exhibition that's going to appear next year. And so I definitely will get in touch with Artist Proof Studio and see how we can support that. Uh, but um, Kara says that funnily enough, uh, it was a aligning with a concept that was discussed by Mandisa about how we're not separate from nature in the world. And I guess, Mandisa, I'm just going to ask if you can make, make a couple more comments about how we how we really emphasize this notion of pulling in literature and the arts to make the connection between, I guess, big corporations and really people and nature, uh, which I think gets forgotten often in the discussion of whether something is financially sustainable. Mm, yeah. Okay. So um, one of the interesting things, one of the things that I found interesting in in, uh, in the novel that I'm citing, Nettie Okrofor's Lagoon, is that she opens it with this fish, right? This like character of a fish who um, swims up to this oil pipe that, and like kind of like tries to like burst the oil pipe so that it would leak, not so that it would poison the water, but so that the big corporation to which the pipe belongs to would up you know, would up, you would, would take it out and like leave and move to different waters. And it kind of, this fish keeps reincarnating. So um, I'm, I'm mentioning that for us to kind of consider this idea of nature itself actively advocating for itself. Um, and I've kind of actively advocating for itself to push uh, corporations, um, 
and to, to challenge corporations because we often think that nature is dying um is like this this like dying figure at the hands of corporations and yes corporations are visiting a lot of violence against the natural environments oil spills um we're looking at the fires right now and when you think that a lot of the fires happening right now in california are not just in california but like are related to gender reveal parties and how something that seems so separate from um kind of corporate environment is very much tied to it as well um but like that 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 image the, the idea that nature is its own custodian and is constantly challenging uh corporations from um continuing pollution um yeah i kind of lost my train of thought there but ultimately at, at the heart of what i'm saying is nature is advocating for itself as this novel shows um and that um even though corporations seem so strong and pervasive and um and kind of like are a an overwhelming force um the ultimate end is is one in which um nature always wins right nature is way more powerful and, and much more stronger um i think also of a novel like pumzi where well it's not a novel it's a short film pumzi by wanuri kahui um where you have a um where you have this lab and everybody exists in this lab uh but somehow a seed a, a life-giving seed um is emerges and that even though the nature the natural environment outside of this lab is a toxic waste uh nature finds ways of surviving itself um ultimately is what i'm saying um and um the corporate environment will should take heed in fact to participate uh with the force that climate is um and uh restrict itself from its exploitation and seize its exploitation because it's contending with some something that will ultimately overcome it. Um. Thank you. So I think that's a wonderful note to end on. I want to thank all of you speakers. I want to thank all of those participants from across the globe, ordinary people who phoned in, sang in on any technology they had available to song. And I really want to thank the young artists who have contributed to making this such a rich webinar. And um, we are sending out links to the artwork, links to the song. Uh, we'll send out a recording of this. And um, we're just deeply um, grateful uh, for having an opportunity, especially someone like me, who's a corporate law professor, to open up our horizons and to think about these issues in fundamentally different ways. Um, the last slide you'll see is uh, how to order the prints and also uh, how to participate in the video. And uh, please have a good day, eve afternoon, evening, and thank you all. <laughs>